Within the Dying Light community, there's always been this ongoing conversation regarding both the original and its sequel on which game is exactly better. Debates from one side state that the sequel is nothing more than its former self and that Teclan is just trying to play catch up with each update to make it more like Dying Light 1, even going as far as reverting or updating various core aspects to align more closely with the original game raises questions about the direction of development. Is this a strategic choice, a misstep in the development? process or is discourse around these changes simply being blown out of proportion the franchise has consistently garnered praise for its exceptional gameplay with the parkour mechanics standing out as a shining feature amongst other games the distinctive elements such as characters infected enemies grand set pieces thrilling night chases and the menacing volatiles contribute to what makes dying light so special and then on top of all that we have cooperative games Gameplay, which adds an extra layer to the game's appeal. <laughs> the burning question remains, which is superior? Did Dying Light 2 venture too far from the elements that made the original game so remarkable, or is it a commendable step in the right direction? Could the nostalgia and the accumulation of years of good memories and community building around Dying Light 1 be influencing opinions? What exactly is transpiring? Today, ladies and gentlemen, we embark on an in-depth comparison between Dying Light 1 versus Dying Light 2 to find out which game truly stands out over the other. Our exploration will span 10 different sections, dissecting each aspect to help us arrive to a conclusive answer. And with that said, my friends, if you have your thoughts and opinions on which game, feel free to comment them down below. But before we do proceed, let's get a quick message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Enlisted, a new kind of first person shooter that uniquely couples PvP and PvE combat. With Enlisted, you can enlist into multiple campaigns, each with its own unique offerings. The campaigns feel like a completely new experience every single time, offering up different equipment, uniforms, vehicles, and much more. And on top of all of this, Enlisted also offers up over 100 different weapons, tanks, and aircraft too, all with authentic sounds and a huge amount of attention and detail put into it. It's quite impressive. And today, you can use my link down below in the description. You can download Enlisted for free on either PC, Xbox, or PlayStation. With my link, you'll get a free bonus pack of multiple weapons, soldiers, and a premium account. And with all that said, my friends, let's get back to it now. Now, traditionally, in comparison videos like this, one might kick it off by diving into the story or the gameplay first. However, to construct a solid foundation, it is crucial to gradually explore other aspects before diving into the major components. Surprisingly, the most significant disparity between these two games lies in their attention to detail. Yet, before we go and tackle that intricate aspect, let's begin our exploration in the realm of identity. We can begin discussing identity simply by looking at the cover of these two games. Dying Light 1 with the slogan right here, Good Night, Good Luck. And then if we change to Dying Light 2, it says stay human. And based off of those two slogans right there, that should tell you exactly what Tech One was aiming for with the overall vibe of these two games. Good night, good luck hints that there's this crippling world on the verge of collapse. The infected, they're new to the survivors, and they're adjusting to the new normal and horrors that they currently find themselves in. And because of that, environments are carefully crafted to express a world that is desperate, eerie, and barely clinging on to hold. Tekken does a really good job at establishing this world's identity, not only through physical objects, attention to detail, but also color. And you're probably wondering, Oni, what the hell do you mean color? Trust me, we'll touch on it in just a moment. The world during the day is dying as it is, but when the lights go out, that's when it becomes truly horrific, nightmarish settings and environments, and it's basically a death sentence to you if you're out past curfew. Oh hey, I'm just about to go to bed. I know we couldn't Skype tonight, but that's alright. Good night, girl. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> 
From the second you begin your journey, characters constantly warn you about the nighttime. You're teased here and there. You're left with a little bit of blue balls, all right? I gotta say. Your first ever exposure to the nighttime in game is when you stay out for too long trying to get an airdrop. You peek through because you hear something and now see something so horrifying, a volatile. You are alone. Here's what you've been waiting for. Good luck. Get back to the tower or you're gonna die. This scene was remarkable and I don't think Teclan truly understood how impactful something like this was until it was too late. The nighttime, which we will discuss later, is integral to the core identity of Dying Light. What is Dying Light's nighttime meant to you personally? Can't do that. But in the sequel, they decided to take things in a different direction at launch. While it has been corrected, the original night that was proposed at launch was not the same, but more on that later. Now, with Dying Light 2 Stay Human, the Stay Human element hints that this is a world that has accepted and, in a way, come to terms with the new world that they're currently living in. A good portion of survivors living in this world were born into it so they don't know what life was like before the apocalypse. They are now focused on rebuilding society, possibly keeping their morals intact and not losing their humanity both physically and mentally too. And because of that, their worlds and their environments are carefully crafted to express those traits. There's a much bigger focus on humans, their stories, their conflicts, and their issues in the sequel here. The main character, Aiden, he has his internal struggles, and it's the plot that drives the game forward. He's looking for his sister. He wants to feel love and acceptance. He wants things to get better. He wants to see some semblance of hope in his life. For more background info, Aiden, he's a pilgrim. He never really had a place to call home. He's always on the lookout for what's next. When it comes to Dying Light 1, it's more so focused on trying to fix and save the world while everything is going wrong. Like literally everything that you could think of that could go wrong in an apocalypse is happening here. It makes sense. Civilization is doomed. It's over. You are watching it collapse and cripple right in front of you. Your friend dies. Big explosion go boom. Your side chick is upset and not really that much into you. The military Military has absolutely no issue bombing the shit out of this place. Characters have no issue with nuking themselves. Humanity is dead. It's over. Cut your ties. We are doomed. The entire game is centered around that and realizing that so much of this is out of your control. But you are trying to save who you can by doing the right thing. That is Crane's internal struggles that drives the game forward, but more on that later. Dying Light 2, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. They are focused on rebuilding, bringing humanity back, themes of hope, heroism, and good morals. If you want, take the forefront. Remember how we mentioned color earlier? Color plays a big role in one's identity here. Since Dying Light 1 centers itself around the fall, doom and gloom, the colors in the game properly reflect that. The game has this orange and yellow tint to it. It's very subtle at times and others, not so much. Orange depicts danger, deceit, a lack of confidence and certainty. There's a warmth to orange and little hints of optimism peek through. Like yes, while the world is crippling, there are still some moments of joy and happiness. Bits and pieces of yellow appear as well, which encourage curiosity and hope. Even though the days are hell, the sun continues to rise and set. There's a more grim approach associated to colors like orange and yellow than compared to, let's say, green and blue, which are more so associated with glory and energy. Green stands for balance, nature, rebirth. There's a freshness behind it. It can represent new beginnings, but also envy and greed, the worst parts of human emotion. Blue represents freedom, intuition, imagination, inspiration. Blue is a sign of peace and stability, which is mainly the color scheme that Dying Light 2 opts in for. Huh. The colors in here, they're more soothing and calming. These colors really express hope and a life to live. And you look out into the open world, it's bright colors. You might have some weird ash trees on top of rooftops for some reason, but the world is mainly trying to convince you that there's more to life in this apocalypse. It's almost peaceful. It's trying to aspire you to do good. 
that. I want to kill some zombies. So TLDR, I'm not reading all of that. Congrats that happened or sorry that it did. Dying Light 1 is focused on the fall of humanity, while the sequel is focused on rebuilding it. One is focused more so on the infected and how they created the collapse, while two is focused on the people and their conflicts. So depending on what you're looking for within your zombie game, you should know exactly this before heading into it. Well, that's section one. I haven't even dived. Oh, I got a hole in my sock. I haven't even dived into the other aspects yet. Holy shit, this is going to be a long video, so do like and subscribe if you haven't already. And with that said, let's transition to music. Now, why music, you may ask? Because I love music. Remember what I did for the one year anniversary? <laughs> So, in gaming, music possesses the extraordinary ability to transform even the smallest moments into unforgettable experiences. Think of the Warhog Run in Halo 3, an exceptional track that elevates the impact and satisfaction as you strive to escape the world's impending doom. The pairing of music with gameplay and on-screen events can swiftly shape mood and tone, creating a profound impact. In the realm of gaming music, two forms exist. Adaptive music, also known as dynamic, and then we have static. Adaptive music is composed in a way that reacts to what is occurring on screen within a game. For example, a track could be changing depending on how you block, attack, and how many enemies are on screen. The music technique in Dying Light 2 is a powerful tool prominently utilizing adaptive music. As you embark on a parkour section, the music gradually builds, picking up the pace with your movement. The longer and more intricate your parkour run is, the music gives you a sense of empowerment, like you're working towards a notable goal. Exploration, combat, and low health situations each have their own distinct tracks, creating an immersive experience. The seamless flow between combat and exploration is particularly noteworthy. It adds an extra layer of immersion. The real-time adaptation of music to your in-game actions is nothing short of incredible, and it's showcased here in Dying Light 2, and it is beautifully done. It was perfect, perfect, everything, down to the last minute details. Contrasting this, many games like Dying Light 1, they opt in for a more static approach. So in static music, there's predetermined moments that trigger specific tracks. During a level or a boss fight, for instance, once the situation concludes, the music stops and the game progresses. And while static music, it has its merits, Adaptive music as showcased in Dying Light 2 has the unique ability to make players feel more engaged and alive by dynamically responding to their actions occurring on screen. Dying Light 2 really holds something special here in terms of musical scores, especially in certain moments of the game they would not be nearly as memorable if it wasn't for the brilliant score. When it comes to the actual themes and soundtracks of these games, they are exceptional. Of course, the music is entangled, not that entangled, with the game's core identity. Everything can fall apart if you have contrasting tones. Dying Light 1's music is focused on despair. It makes the player experience the crippling world of Haran, the haunting beauty of a forgotten civilization, and the now relentless brutality of the undead. The music becomes more than a backdrop. It's an emotional conduit, inviting players to feel the weight of the world that they navigate. In. in Dying Light 2, the music takes on a transformative role, shifting its focus from despair to a beacon of hope. The soundtrack becomes a symphony of inspiration, echoing the resilience of humanity. Players parkour and explore, they will listen to music that's more uplifting, that has an emphasis on a brighter future or rebuilding a better one. The music becomes a driving force, empowering players to navigate through challenges ahead with a sense of purpose and the belief amidst the 
the ruins that a better world can be reforged. Soundtracks and music contribute so much to the overall gaming experience that it crafts a unique identity that resonates with players on a personal level. My god, I lied love music, Jesus Christ. Now, let's go ahead and shift topics a little bit to attention to detail. Let's specifically focus in on weather systems and lighting. I think this is one area where Dying Light 2 is incredibly lacking, and that is a compelling and engaging weather system. And all of this goes hand in hand to making a world and its environment feeling alive and, and not dead and dull. And when it comes to attention to detail, this is where the biggest differences between the two really start to shine through. In the original Dying light you could stand there and simply watch the sunset you can see time change and you could see the sun move from one side of the map to the other it's actually quite dynamic and properly working and overall quite impressive for a game that came out almost nine years ago but when you compare that to dying light 2 that simply doesn't exist and this is where you can start seeing examples of the developers cutting corners on their final product the skybox literally filters through like seven to ten different static slideshow images for their lighting system in the game there's nothing dynamic about this it's so bizarre I'm here to chase you by the way to stop you from like doing all this bad stuff. What? 80s kid grown up he did an amazing five minute video tackling this subject that i'll link down below the day and night cycle it just doesn't make sense and you can tell that it's lazily done it gets to a point where you can have two suns in the open world what's going on here and then the sun just slowly fades in and remains in the same position until that same sun disappears and then shit where the hell is the sun oh it's in the middle of the sky now why we didn't see it move and then it just rinses and repeats <laughs> Techland developed this to have set static positions in your open world. Rather than having a dynamic sun that moves from one side of the map to another, this is what they opted in for. Just subtle attention to detail like this really goes a long way in dissecting how much love and care this sequel got. Now, I understand that you may think this is a nitpick or something extreme that I'm blowing out of proportion. To that, I have to say that these seemingly minor details contribute significantly to the overall experience. And unfortunately, there are several instances where Dying Light 2 falls incredibly short in attention to detail. These collective shortcomings, it just makes the game feel somewhat disjointed and peculiar. Like, it's no secret that Dying Light 2 is constantly updating in order to make it better but when there's these fundamental differences between the first game and the second game is it even worth investing more time and effort into things like this it's also worth noting that the moon is the exact same way that bitch just sits there in the exact same spot for the entire night Whereas in Dying Light 1, we had some movement. Not only did we have movement, but we had clouds that would get in the way. And when it rains, it would react accordingly. And the nighttime would be pitch black. Ow! Charlie Horse! When it comes to dynamic weather in both games, it's not really a thing. Both games will randomly have sections where it's raining, sunny outside, dark and gloomy. You just won't see a change in real time. Most of the time it happens on the back end. So if you get into a loading screen while it's sunny, it could change to rain and thunder once you're out of it. Rain in general feels better in Dying Light 1 and it really adds to the overall atmosphere that the game is trying to sell. Despite a world that is on the verge of collapse, this actually feels quite relaxing and calming to just sit here and overlook the environment. It has a soothing presence to it. The ambience that this game has alongside its music and sound design is incredible here. The rain in Dying Light 2, it's just not up to par. They don't do it as well as I would have liked to have seen in the sequel. There are times where you can't even tell 
that it's raining or there are times where you're just fighting the game to be able to see what's happening in front of you the ambience in dying light 2 feels like something is missing as discussed a majority of that reason is just how static dying light 2 is over its counterpart it almost feels like they had these really ambitious ideas honestly they're not even ambitious it just feels rushed like tech one wanted to put more time into certain elements but simply didn't have the time to do so so they cut corners i also think when it comes to the ambience in dying light 2 it just feels like it's constantly reminding you that you are in fact playing a video game like just doing a parkour run you're hit with various waypoints and markers despite your hud being completely off with dying light 1 it just feels like you're fully immersed into the zombie experience as i mentioned earlier the disparity and attention to detail stands out as the most prominent distinction between these two games without a doubt when it comes to this aspect dying light one emerges as the front runner and i'm going to tell you exactly why there's an unmistakable sense that dying light 2 took shortcuts and it lacks the same charm love care and attention that defined the original for this one i also want to point out another video from 80s kid grown up bro he should have just done this video he did an incredible job with explaining some of the reasons that we're going to go over here too number one weapon degrading when examining the weapon mechanics a notable contrast arises between dying light one and dying light two in the latter there's a notable absence of wear and tear on weapons over time regardless of how much you swing away your weapon appears identical to one full durability this stands in stark contrast to the intricate system in dying light one where you witness gradual deterioration of a weapon with each use not only does the weapon visibly show signs of wear and tear but when you repair it it results in a distinct and renewed appearance unfortunately this nuanced feature seems to be absent in dying light 2 contributing to the perception that some of the intricacies and attention to detail present in the original game might be overlooked in the sequel number two safe houses and metro stations when it comes to safe houses in dying light 2 a very problematic noticeable pattern emerges they all share a strikingly similar setup particularly the metro station safe houses presents a noteworthy drawback each underground location lacks distinctiveness making it a challenge to orient oneself without resulting to frequent pausing and checking the map to find out where the hell you are in contrast dying light one excels in this aspect nearly every single safe house in the first installment boosts a unique identity with each location offering a different atmosphere and layout the individuality of each safe house in the original adds a layer of richness and diversity which is just missing from the sequel here number three GRE quarantine zones GRE buildings you know that stuff in dying light 2 the inclusion of GRE buildings adds a layer of engagement to the gameplay it allows players to earn rewards and inhibitors for character progression however the issue lies in the repetitive nature of these locations each GRE building seems like a carbon copy of the previous one with a repetitive cycle of progressing through identical floors and completing the same tasks over and over this contrasts sharply with dying light one where gre quarantine zones while serving a similar purpose for end game progression it showcased a distinct difference in detail and variety the original game invests more time in crafting diverse locations contributing to a rich and varied game identity a quality that feels somewhat lacking in the sequel here it's evident that dying light 2 may have fallen into the trap of adhering too closely to the checkboxes of most modern open world game design repeatable challenges and trendy elements like windmills this adherence to industry norms may have inadvertently led to a sacrifice of creativity and originality that defined the first installment leaving players with an experience that despite its merits 
feels somewhat lacking in uniqueness. Number four, random encounters. In the expansive open world of Dying Light, the thrill of exploration is enriched by a variety of random encounters that breathe life into the post-apocalyptic streets here. Dying Light 1 excels in this regard, offering diverse scenarios like survivors, desperately fighting off hordes, tense hostage situations, clashes with hostile survivors, intense demolisher battles, and the charming appearances of traveling merchants who can give you some goodies as you're traveling around. The inclusion of random escort missions provide an opportunity to bring survivors back to the safety of the tower for some extra rewards. That adds a layer of depth to the experience. Dying Light 2 seeks to build on this foundation by expanding the scope of random encounters, and this is something that they've added into the game over time with more and more updates. We have random encounters such as the Plague Bearers, Tyrants, Hives, and much more. Prior to the release of those updates, it may have been incredibly lacking. Going from Dying Light 1 to Dying Light 2, a noticeable shift occurs focused more on human interactions rather than the infected, and while the initial charm of scenes like survivors cook and stew or engaging in various activities adds a unique touch, the novelty begins to wear thin over time. Repeatedly witnessing the same funeral or encountering the same characters getting stung by a bee, just that different parts of the map, it starts to get very dull over time. The richness and variety that made the original game's encounters engaging seems to be sacrificed here in favor of consistency, leading to a sense of repetitiveness that can detract from the immersive quality of the open world experience. Now, let's go ahead and dive into the gameplay section, where we'll explore various elements including physics, ragdolls, and other captivating aspects that contribute to the overall gaming experience. Let's kick off our exploration with gameplay, honing in on the main attraction the parkour. A truly unique element, especially when the original was released back in 2015, there wasn't really other games out there like this. Like yes, there were other games like Assassin's Creed, but that franchise took a, a nosedive. One minute I'm eagle diving into a haystack, the next thing I know, I'm beating the shit out of George Washington. Assassin's Creed went downhill a little bit, except for that absolute gem that is Black Flag. Honestly, I could talk about Black Flag for hours, might make a video about it one day. However, However, in 2015, nothing was really on the market that offered a first-person parkour experience quite like Dying Light. We did have Mirror's Edge, but that was more so focused on puzzles rather than with Dying Light where it seamlessly blended excellent melee combat with exceptional parkour, setting it apart from most games on the market, but also this sea of zombie games that were just flooding out there trying to capitalize on the genre at that time. Mirror's Edge attempted combat, but it was abysmal to say the least. The gunplay is so rough, and frankly, I would rather take my car, drive it into a river, lock the doors, put the child locks on, and go in the back seat. It's that bad. Dying Light's parkour experience was satisfying and unique. While some games claim if you see it, you can go there, Dying Light embodied those words, offering a wide range of movement options and tools for transversal. Scaling buildings, leaping off of rooftops onto cars, climbing these huge radio towers, it was all part of this unparalleled experience. The journey from point A to point B was an adventure every single time, and over the years, it expanded with extra additions like the Doom Buggy. Dying Light 2 builds on this foundation, introducing a more complex parkour system, and it also has the return of the grappling hook, and this time, the newest addition, the paraglider. It is awesome. The world is designed to complement this system. It's so much more vertical, with massive skyscrapers. You can climb up that. The introduction of verticality in Dying Light 2 brings a fresh perspective to the parkour system, offering a dynamic experience that was absent from the original. The ability to freely navigate the vertical landscape adds a breathtaking dimension to the gameplay, allowing players to explore and transverse the environment with a newfound sense of freedom. This innovation enhances the overall parkour experience, contributing to this game's distinctiveness and reinforcing its position as a notable improvement over its predecessor. 
Despite the parkour's complexity, Dying Light 2's parkour is so much more accessible, with the recent Good Night Good Luck update refining player control making it tight and quick, addressing the previous criticisms of a floaty parkour feeling. The sequel's parkour represents a huge improvement, and it's a testament to the developer's commitment to refining the player's experience. In Dying Light as a whole, parkour takes center stage, and the overall experience is deeply influenced by factors such as location and time of day. The parkour mechanics stand as the pinnacle of the Dying Light series, and they are undoubtedly a key reason players gravitate towards these games. The complexity and fluidity of the parkour system, particularly in the sequel, showcases Techland's innovation and commitment to refining gameplay mechanics within the gaming industry. This is what makes it stand out. This is what separates Dying Light apart from other titles in the genre. Whether you start with the original or the sequel, the parkour remains as a satisfying and integral aspect of the gameplay, solidifying its position as a standout feature in the series. Now, location. Dying Light 2 introduces two primary locations, the Central Loop and Old Villador. The Central Loop stands out as that vertical playground that we discussed in the previous section. It provides an expansive and engaging open world sandbox for players to freely explore and enjoy with friends. While the setting excels in offering diverse opportunities for parkour maneuvers, it does fall short when considering the variety of activities and the overall repetitive nature of this environment. We recently discussed in our attention to detail section so you know exactly how I feel about what this actual world encompasses. But strictly looking at it as a parkour playground, it has a lot to offer. Despite these drawbacks, the central loop remains a true standout. As for old Villador, it is arguably one of the least captivating locations in the entirety of Dying Light. It lacks the vibrancy and appeal found in other areas. The absence of the verticality that works so efficiently in the central loop contributes to a mundane and dull atmosphere. Upon closer inspection, the buildings in this area appear nearly identical, giving off a sense of repetition. Old Villador, it shares similarities with the issues found in the safe houses and the GRE buildings, prioritizing size over richness and variety. It seems that Tekwin opted for a location that despite its scale, it lacks the substance and diversity found in the more compelling parts of the game world. For any players of Dying Light 2, I think I speak for like 90% of us, but when it comes to post-game, end-game, we spend a majority of our time in Central Loop. We may go back to Old Villador to visit a vendor or two or maybe grab a bounty or collectible, but there is nothing refreshing when comparing it to the Central Loop. I will say, it is a great way to get your grasp on the parkour system before you start tackling more complex skyscrapers with multiple floors, ropes, yada yada yada. In Dying Light 1, we were treated to two locations, the slums and Old Town. Old Town, with its more city-like environment and crammed streets, brings a great diversity to the game. Navigating through a city with populated zombie-infested rooftops is both fun and also challenging. The design of Old Town offers a wide range of parkour options, leveraging the urban landscape to create a dynamic and engaging experience for players. Personally, I do hold a special bias for the slums. It holds a special unique place in my heart. The slums serve as the starting point for the Dying Light journey, marking the place where so many players embarked on their adventure and became fans for years to come. There's an undeniable charm and nostalgia associated with this location, especially considering it's where players first experience the exhilarating thrill of parkour of a game in this nature. Despite lacking the same verticality showcased in Dying Light 2, the slums in Dying Light 1 stands out as the perfect location. Like I said, <laughs> biased. It compensates for its vertical limitations with the sheer quality invested in the design. The presence of hordes of zombies in Dying Light 1 was incredible, and that's something that is absent in the sequel. This ongoing threat not only added to the enduring appeal of the game, but also heightened the overall intensity of the slums in Dying Light 1. We also have to remember that the slums is where we first experienced the nighttime. Now, this is where things are going to get a bit more controversial. Now, when Dying Light 2 launched, it altered the nighttime experience 
experience by adapting a more arcade-like and less realistic approach in favor for player accessibility. This change inadvertently diminished the unique charm of the original. Dying Light 1, it was all about those intense and terrifying nights. Dying Light 1 began those horrific night times, which became integral to the franchise's identity. While the nighttime experience has improved in Dying Light 2's Good Night Good Luck update, it still falls short of the impact achieved in Dying Light 1. The memorable introduction mission in the original, where players fearfully navigated to the tower, it just lacks the same charm and intensity in the sequel. In Dying Light 1, the initial impression of night was so strong to players that they actively avoided it. A sentiment that cannot be fully replicated because of the arcade-like feeling in Dying Light 2, despite recent updates. Nights became a heart-pounding test of survival, and from day one, the original understood the assignment. The game's chilling atmosphere during nighttime is not merely a backdrop, but an integral part of gameplay. You needed to plan your routes, plan your gameplay all around a time of day but unfortunately that was lost in the sequel in the sequel various elements that worked so well in the original were removed such as roaming volatiles on the rooftops volatiles triggering chases and when you did encounter them it just felt kind of forced and stiff friend of the channel aussie gg did an incredible video outlining the differences between the dynamic knights in the original versus the static ones found in the sequel Techwine's creative decisions, it made the threat and danger of nighttime completely lost. That's how it was at launch, and while it has been reworked entirely in updates to include certain elements that worked in the original, there are often times where it doesn't feel like you're as engaged about the potential dangers at night. For the longest time, color, I know we're back on the topic of color, but the visual representation of darkness during the night in Dying Light 2 was overly bright. It failed to convey a genuine sense of nighttime, despite, you know, <laughs> the sun disappearing, and the moon being right there for a while. While Tekwin did recognize this concern and made updates to darken the visuals, it just doesn't feel the same. So Dying Light 1, it remains unparalleled, immersing players in the chilling sounds of distant zombie cries and terrifying screeches. The sequel, on the other hand, it's good, but it's by no means perfect. It does have some plus sides to it. The distressing cries of people in need, desperate pleas for help, and chaotic screams. Gerard yelling that he's getting stung by a bee. It is really immersive. In certain aspects, Dying Light 2 nails it, in others, not so much, it just feels disjointed at times. Overall, because of how the nighttime was handled from the very beginning, Dying Light 1 Nights just remains superior. I understand the rationale behind Tech One's decision to alter the night experience in response to player preferences aiming to make it more accessible. However, despite these efforts, the unique and chilling atmosphere of the original Dying Light's nighttime just strongly resonated with players and that diminished in the sequel here. Both games feature a variety of infected foes, with the Volatiles standing out as the most menacing. They're basically the mascot of the Dying Light franchise. And Dying Light 2 receives praise for its introduction of different infected types, including Howlers, Banshees, and Revenants, adding depth and variety to the challenges that players face. In the original Dying Light, the combat experience against Infected is noticeable for its impactful and weighty feeling. Swinging melee weapons delivers a remarkable sensation with each action carrying a sense of weight. The attention to detail extends to the physics and ragdoll effects in here, as zombies stumble and react realistically to the player's movements. Tripping over, knocking into each other, and responding to their surroundings adds an extra layer of immersion. Unfortunately, Recently, Dying Light 2 actually falls short in this aspect. While improvements have been made over time, the physics and ragdolls lack that same attention to detail. Tech One seems to have prioritized an animation-heavy approach here, impacting the overall feel of gameplay interaction. The absence of robust physics and detailed ragdoll effects in Dying Light 2 contributes to a noticeable disconnect with satisfying gameplay. The game's emphasis on animations over nuanced physics can result in this awkward and 
less polished gameplay experiences, highlighting a departure from combat dynamics found in the original Dying Light. While certain infected do have more consistent ragdolls and physics, such as the volatiles in Dying Light 2, but overall at its current state, it's lacking well behind the original here. A bit more patching and updating could bring it up to speed. Now, I do want to go ahead and transition to one of the fundamental pillars of Dying Light, the combat system, which plays a crucial role in shaping the overall experience. The synergy between parkour and combat, it creates an awesome gameplay loop. Starting with Dying Light 1, the combat with zombies is great. It is enhanced by the impressive ragdoll physics that we explored earlier. Striking and battling the undead is deeply satisfying. It really gives you that sense of impact and realism here. However, when shifting the focus to combat against human enemies, it's actually quite the opposite. The combat experience with humans feels less refined and quite repetitive, while battling zombies showcases the game's polish with responsive reactions and great AI programming, the interactions with human enemies lack the same finesse. Their tendency to frequently block and engage in counterattacks, it just introduces a level of frustration to the player. It reveals that there is a noticeable imbalance to the overall combat mechanics. Like honestly, every single time I was forced into a section where I needed to fight humans, I just took my gun and erased them from this earth. Transitioning to Dying Light 2, a reversal occurs in the combat dynamics. Here, the focus on human combat takes center stage, showcasing well-crafted engagements and a much more polished experience. The encounters of humans, they feel more nuanced, strategic, and less repetitive compared to the original. It's quite funny how all the way back in the identity section of this video, we discussed that Dying Light 1 had a greater focus on the infected, while the sequel was more so on humans. The core gameplay combat loop further proves that point. The absence of basic features like ragdolls and physics during zombie combat in Dying Light 2, it diminishes the engagement, creating an experience. It doesn't feel like a fully immersive zombie apocalypse, which was achieved in Dying Light 1. In Dying Light 1, the synergy between various elements contributed to a cohesive experience where every single aspect worked together seamlessly to create a believable zombie infested world. Unfortunately, this seamless integration is just lacking in Dying Light 2. That's not to say it'll get there one day, but for right now, it's not there. Diving into the skills and abilities, an interesting observation emerges. Many skills in Dying Light 2 mirror those that were unlocked on day one in Dying Light 1, creating an interesting imbalance for players transitioning from the original to the sequel. The sense of progression may feel somewhat skewed as characters in the sequel unlock abilities reminiscent of those acquired eight years ago. Aside from that, skills are expanded upon in the sequel, offering up new abilities like wall running, far jump, double jump, the wall run combo, which honestly, it became the staple of parkour abilities that just weren't present in the OG. Alongside the drop kick for combat abilities, like drop kicking is just ridiculous in this game. It has no right being as good as as it is in the sequel here. What? Tech One was onto something here. Now, I do want to go ahead and analyze the depiction of gore in both games. We'll be examining the current state of gore in each title. In the gut feeling update for Dying Light 2, the gore system underwent a substantial overhaul to enhance its brutality. Personally, I believe both games have reached a level of equality in their gore systems. I think Dying Light 2 actually has a little bit of an edge just because nearly every single NPC and in Infected is able to be dismembered here, while in Dying Light 1, the options were a bit more limited. It is worth noting that prior to the update, the gore implementation in Dying Light 2 was shit. It, it was a joke, to be quite frank with you. As we mentioned earlier, Dying Light 2 was heavily focused on animations for a significant period, and that left the satisfaction of gore and brutality almost non existent. It's essential to note that in comparison to both titles, neither of them reached to the level of gore as seen in games like Dead Island 2, which is just on a whole new level of intensity. Lastly, in the gameplay section, I do want to touch on co-op and PvP aspects. While co-op adds a tremendous dimension to both titles, it's worth noting that upon its initial release, the Dying Light 2 co-op experience had so many issues and so many bugs. 
and it's still lacking the polish as seen in Dying Light 1. The co-op functionality in Dying Light 2 needs a substantial improvement to match the seamless experience provided by its predecessor, which benefited from 7 plus years of support, so they have that going for it. I mean, Dying Light 2 just got a text chat. <laughs> Nonetheless, when co-op functions smoothly in both games, it leads to hilarious and memorable moments, creating some of the best gaming experiences that I've had. It's one of those games where if you have the friends to play it, it will make it so much better than if you played it alone. It's not a necessity to play it with someone else, you'll just get more out of the experience. And also, of course, Dying Light 1 did have Be The Zombie, a competitive game mode that was perfect for endgame players to keep themselves busy. I never really dive too much into this game mode but i know that there's a strong community of like five people still playing it i'm kidding there's a very strong community still behind it no such competitive game mode exists in dying light 2 at the moment dying light 2 kind of got rid of modes because they had a stronger focus on story now in the realm of these two games the story it takes a backseat it serves more as a backdrop to the immersive gameplay as mentioned in my dead island 2 vs dying light 2 video the narratives play a secondary role with neither game designed to be a narrative powerhouse however a stark distinction arises when comparing how each game handles its storytelling Dying Light 2 attempts to inject a sense of depth and player agency through a compelling narrative with the choices and consequences system. Ooh. The execution of this falls flat. It leads to a very sluggish and dragged out experience that pales out to the swift pacing of the first installment, Dying Light 1, which mainly features a pretty generic story, but it does manage to strike a balance, allowing players to enjoy it for what it is. The narrative pacing in this story is super quick, and it employs familiar tropes reminiscent of other games in this time frame. It's not pushing to do anything extraordinary at all. And we already talked about Aiden Caldwell in Dying Light 2 in the beginning of this video, but with Kyle Crane, he starts out as your typical Black Ops military dude who's hired to do a job, and that's really his identity. It isn't until over time you start to see his struggles, what he stands for, and how he slowly pushes himself out of that typical generic hero. He has that charming and cocky wit to him that made him so beloved over time from the community. His character arc, it kind of flies through in the game. It it isn't really until the following where we can see fully what this person was destined to be. The one where he wants to save as many people as possible and do the right thing. There's minimal room for resting, the storyline just hurdles forward with rapid fire action. However, where Dying Light 2 does shine is its character development. The characters such as Hakon, Lawan, and Frank, they're given ample screen time, allowing their personalities, their motivations, and dreams, and aspirations to unfold right in front of you. This depth makes the characters more compelling to the relatively limited exposure and development of characters like Brecken, Jade, and Raheem in the first game. In this aspect, Dying Light 2 succeeds creating a more memorable and engaging cast. Nonetheless, despite the character depth, other shortcomings in gameplay and surrounding elements contribute to an overall forgetting experience, leaving players more invested in character drama rather than the overarching narrative. A lot of what the story is aiming to do falls back on the identity aspect. The best way to describe these two and what they're aiming for is by discussing their peak. Analyzing the pinnacle story missions that define them. Dying Light's final chase through the sores, where the player is in a race against time, propelled by the urgency of the game's antagonist and what he's planning to do. The player finds themselves deep in a volatile hive, with bodies and infected everywhere. The intensity of this moment is heightened by a gripping soundtrack, urging you to move forward, not out of actions of heroism or inspiration, but out of desperation. Every calculated jump in this mission is mainly out of terror and fear. Now, let's go ahead and shift focus to Dying Light 2's pinnacle mission, scaling the VNC tower. This moment is marked by inspiration and triumph. It represents the culmination of sacrifices made by characters met throughout the narrative. Similar to the sewers, you apply all of your knowledge and skills for this critical moment. Nothing else matters to you 
then ascending that tower, you want to get to the top to prove it to yourself and all the other people that you met on your journey that you can do it. Nothing else matters as you ascend the tower. It is a personal challenge to prove, unlike the fear-driven desperation of its predecessor. Dying Light 2 pivots towards motivation rooted in heroism. As you climb, swing, and jump, the goal is not personal escape, but it's a testament to the strength that you've gained and you're doing it for everybody you met, except for Churro, F that guy. In essence, Dying Light 1 hones in on the fear. It grapples with the horror at the core of the zombie genre. Dying Light 2 shifts its focus to the buried hope underneath a grim world, centering its narrative on strength and rebuilding a society. Both games, despite their thematic differences, they skillfully do resonate with the player to some degree. Now, I do want to go ahead and shift the focus to post-launch support and DLC for both of the Dying Light games here. They are significant factors to discuss. Dying Light 1 being released 8 years ago enjoyed 7 years of continuous support. It has a substantial amount of additional content when compared to Dying Light 2. Techland has indeed committed themselves to a 5 year support plan until 2027 for Dying Light 2, so they are here to stick around. What's worth mentioning is that one year into the life cycle of these games, Dying Light 1 had the Bozak DLC be the zombie on release. Granted, it was tied to a pre-order bonus for the longest time, which is another issue to discuss later. But almost exactly one year later, Dying Light 1 received Dying Light the following alongside the Enhanced Edition. And the following is considered one of the best expansions and pieces of content within the franchise. The following was exceptional, introducing a wealth of new content, such as additional areas to explore, diverse activities, the beloved Doom Buggy, new weapons, increased levels a compelling story extension all within the first year of release and when you compare that to dying light 2 it's still waiting for its second dlc which not much information has been given aside from a few pr picks dying light 2 has faced challenges in its post-launch content reception the release of bloody ties dlc was met with a lot of critical responses and right now there seems to be a huge emphasis on purchasable bundles which honestly is not something new to the franchise, but when you compare and look at the data, you can see where the issues start to arise. Dying Light 1 had 22 paid bundles and 6 free ones. Meanwhile, Dying Light 2, after 2 years, has 20 paid bundles with more in the pipeline, indicating a different approach and perhaps a greater focus on monetized content with cosmetics and outfits and weapons compared to the original. In terms of free updates, Tech One is dedicated to refining Dying Light 2 based on player feedback with regular monthly and sometimes weekly updates. The community updates represent substantial improvements to the game's quality of life and also addressing major player requests. While some players express the sentiment that certain updates should have been present at launch, like a text chat at launch, the ongoing changes, including nods to the original game like the night update, indicate Tech One's commitment to delivering the desired gaming experience for everyone involved. With Dying Light 2, Tech One has fully embraced the collaborative mindset, actively seeking and incorporating player feedback to enhance the game collaboratively. They actively do playtests with creators and members from the community in order to achieve that. On top of all this, both games have introduced free updates to maintain player engagement and investment. The crossover events in the original featuring Rust and the Left 4 Dead 2 were highly praised for seamlessly incorporating elements from those IPs into the game. However, with Dying Light 2's approach to events, it faces heavy criticism every single time because of their focus on bounties and grind rather than delivering a quality and engaging experience. Now, in conclusion, both Dying Light 1 and Dying Light 2 stand as commendable games showcasing exceptional parkour mechanics and engaging combat gameplay. Some games excel in different aspects. Dying Light 1, with its focus on infected, establishes a robust identity and benefits from superior attention to detail, physics, and ragdolls, providing a more immersive and polished gameplay experience. Dying Light 1 immerses players into a world of grim despair. The haunting soundtrack 
Act seamlessly complements this desolation, intensifying the emotional connection of the undead infested environment. In contrast, Dying Light 2 transforms its world, infusing it with inspiration and heroism. The music empowers players to navigate the challenges ahead with a sense of purpose, reinforcing their role as a beacon of hope in society. Dying Light 2 forges its identity around human conflicts and rebuilding society. In these games, like we said, the story is not the main focus, but it's rather a backdrop to immersive gameplay. But Dying Light 2 tries to add depth through a narrative with choices and consequences, but it falls short and it leads to a slow and drawn out experience when compared to the first game. Dying Light 1, while having a simpler story, it strikes a better balance, letting players enjoy it for what it is. Navigating the parkour landscapes in Dying Light 1 is undoubtedly enjoyable, but it doesn't quite match the verticality as showcased in Dying Light 2. The sequel introduces a more complex parkour system and a world designed to enhance the vertical movement featuring massive skyscrapers and structures absent from the original. While Dying Light 1 provides a satisfying parkour experience, the sequel takes it to new heights with its intricate system in a world that encourages free movement in breathtaking ways. Dying Light 2 faced criticism for creative decisions that didn't resonate with the community prompting developers to revert certain aspects to align more closely with the original. A lot of their changes felt either very forced, rushed, or poorly executed in the beginning. And Techland now acknowledges these challenges, and they're actively working towards refining and enhancing Dying Light 2, aiming to achieve a level of polish that satisfied the player base in the original. But anyways, friends... That is the end of today's video, okay? I have said every single thing I wanted to say about Dying Light 1 versus Dying Light 2. And if you did enjoy this, please drop a like and a comment. Let me know your thoughts down below. I spent so much time on this video. I have no idea how long it's going to take me to edit this. But if you did enjoy videos like this and you want to see more where they're super long, basically documentary style movies, let me know. It was always on my bucket list as a creator to do like an hour long plus video like this. And we finally did it and I couldn't be any happier. I think this may be my peak as a creator. And I'm not sure if I'm ever gonna be able to reach beyond this. But anyways, thank you for watching and I'll see you later. Bye bye. Woo! <laughs>。thank you so much to Enlisted for sponsoring this video by using the link down below in the description you can play on either PC Xbox or PlayStation by using my link down below you'll get a free bonus pack of multiple weapons soldiers and a premium account and with that said my friends I'll see you later bye bye